Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights, Part 3, the final part of the two-hour conversation I had with Dave Zenzel, Steve Taft, and Ryan Jessup, all uh, star company aficionados. They clearly were in that camp. I knew that going in. They weren't blindsiding me. I wasn't blindsiding them, but uh, we had a spirited conversation that you can listen in on. Again, the episodes are a little bit longer because this was edited and fit into three episodes that total a little more than an hour, and yet uh, we spent two hours. So I needed to edit, and I enjoyed that, but the meaning is there, and I am at their service for further conversations if they want to ponder what was said, and Ryan, I think, is taking me up on that in a week or so. So thanks, everybody. Here's the final part, not the final word, but the final part of this discussion about the Star Company. In fact, I need to say it's more about the Star Company than it is about XRCs or Michael Jordan. That enters into it, but a big part of my reasoning was just on the nature of the Star Company itself, how it was admittedly very different from other major licensees. In fact, uh, my position is it was not a major licensee. Anyway, here it is. Thanks again. I'm 99.999 positive that Levin never took possession of the Type 2s. Everything I ever saw that came out of Star with the 85.6 issue, everything that was in bags was always the original. Everything that Todd and Bill won in that private auction in the spring of 1990 And then they made a couple other purchases after that cleaned them out. But there were never any Type 2s involved in that. Shop at home, that's a different story. I got firsthand from the private investigator what he told me. Ravel talked to him. And Levin has a different story than what I heard from the private investigator. But I I believe you. all, All that stuff about reprinting his cards... He didn't have the ability to reprint his cards. Second up is the NBA attorneys told me specifically the two printers that Levin did use were out of business. How do you take your stuff to it? I've I've heard that, and I I totally believe you. The problem is, why didn't PSA believe you? Well, the the plug on it, and you're down the road from them. I, I I was directly involved in that, Jim. I bought a couple cards from the guys that worked at the print shop that did the Type 2. And that's what made me become a so called expert because that's when I started researching everything. And I sent in a, a Jordan card, and PSA graded it. But in the 10 days it took to get it back, I realized it wasn't a legitimate card. I went to Mike Baker, sat down with him and showed him, and he felt pretty comfortable. He could tell the difference at that point, but somebody above him cut it off. I believe David Hall, the owner of PSA and PCGS. I always felt they would never grade Star Company until David Hall was no longer with the company. As soon as Nat Turner took control of it. I had a call from them shortly after expressing interest in doing Star. I I knew David Hall, and David Hall was totally a capitalist. He did the risk-reward, Steve, and he said the reward is not worth the risk, in spite of the fact that you are in their backyard. And that says a lot to me. That's the consumer confidence in the star product and more the star company. That's just a perception though. Being convicted of a crime that never happened. I'm not defending Robert Levin as a person. I want to be crystal clear that I'm with you and I understand. That's not what I'm saying. Raising a skeptical eye is a good thing. And being aware of all that and cognizant and talking it through is great. However, you're almost being punished on a crime that never happened or you're trying to say something's going to happen. Steve said from 83 to 86, no problems. Afterwards, you had these things, but the skepticism was there, but nothing well, there, happened. Oh, there, there, there were lawsuits. There's something there else besides, besides the skepticism, the second part to the story is PSA had already graded probably 30 to 40 of those type twos. And being involved in it at the time, they tried to sweep it under the rug. This is me speculating. I don't think they wanted to pay out their guarantee because those 117 Jordans and the best of the new Jordans were a couple grand a piece at that time. And I don't think they wanted to pay out. Although they probably wouldn't have had to because I'm guessing 
those were submitted by the, the guys that worked at the print shop. I'm correctly accusing Robert Levin of not running a tight ship. Understood, yeah. Okay. Nice. From a I'm not saying he's dishonest, yeah. but there were so many irregularities, Ryan, that... I'm not fighting that. That's so not he's something I'm arguing. That, and that's enough for PSA to say, we're not going to tie our reputation to him and, and some of his dealings. And well, that's a good decision they made. From what I understood, this is an ownership change thing PSA did. So Nat Turner, which is funny, he's one of the people who said the star is the rookie card. He said the 86 Flair is not the rookie card. The star is. And him having the reins at PSA, now they're grading. So now all of a sudden the risk reward is different. I think the reason the risk reward changed is because BGS, Beckett Grading Services, took a chance in 2000, did pretty well. They missed a couple cards here and there, but 99 point something percent has worked pretty well for them. So I, I think that minimized the risk because at least PSA with the new ownership could say, hey, it's worked for Beckett. If they can do it, we should be able to do it. I admire Matt and that. He's, he's thinking big. He's not thinking, hey, I'm going to be first in all these things, but I'm going to be second in the star company grading. No, he's looking at all the crossovers and all that stuff. I have no problem with that. I'm just trying to make sure we understand that back in 1990, star company was not considered a major manufacturer. They were not held in high esteem. And the, the other thing, Steve, maybe you can speak to the exact of this, but cards in 84, 85, in the 83, 84, 85, 86, cards were approximately two cents a piece. Now, in 89, when Upper Deck came out, there was a huge recoil and a big hubbub because Upper Deck was doubling that. Packs were going to be 89 cents or 99 cents. They were doubling the price of packs and cards were going to be five or six cents a card. So they were going to be doubling. But Star Company cards back in that time were... 10 times that. They yeah. Two cents. They were 20 yeah. cents. Some Look of that was wholesale. Me. And that was not appreciated, but just like people thought, oh, Upper Deck's not going to make it. They did. But Upper Deck was a major card company instantly and had superior photography and quality control and the hologram and all that stuff. Think of 81 2 Tops basketball. That was a penny a card. Penny a card. And, all, and yet, when the star team sets came out, there were eight to 12 cards per. Per team, we'll call it 10 to round it. The wholesale price was a dollar and a quarter for a bag. So 12 and a half cents per card. So it's, that was it's, a lot. I'm saying that, that was, was part of the lot. resistance. And that was the perception, not that it was a cash grab, because if it was a cash grab, it was a pitifully executed cash grab because they either needed to go way upscale, which was not in the cards at that time, or lower the price. And he already wasn't making money. Like I said, he had a bad business yeah. model and upper deck. It is a miracle of our time that they became an instant major manufacturer and they caught the Ken Griffey train. If, if you were producing the monthly magazine during Jordan's rookie season, how would you have labeled the 101 card when it first came out? I didn't have to make that decision at that time, but there wouldn't have been any Fleer. I would have been really disappointed to know that there's 3,000 sets, 5,000 sets, 7,000 sets like that. There wouldn't be a magazine because there wouldn't be demand. It's hard to say. You, you guys are looking hindsight. The hobby in those days, they were not early adopters. They were wait and see, prove yourself. When Star came out with these way high prices compared to buying packs and seeing what you're going to get, people said, that's not right. That's not fair. And who is this Robert Levin or who is Star Company? Can we go visit their offices? No. What, who are their vouchers? They had some people that were their distributors. But early on, they weren't that well known. They were the guys at the shows that did all the small sets. So it, it just was like a boutique company, not a major card manufacturer. Would I have tried to do wait and see? I don't know. I would have canvassed. Well, they would have been your only basketball card. It's I know, but we wouldn't have had a magazine. I put them in the book, guys, and I tracked the prices. Levin was overjoyed that I was legitimizing his sets, and I got criticism for that. How dare you legitimize this overpriced stuff from a quick print? that the guy can go print up some more if he wants to. And I said, no, he's licensed. They're going to track that. And Steve has canceled checks. And I'm pretty sure they only did thousands of sets, not tens of thousands of sets. But it, even if he sold out, Steve, he'd have gone out of business. It's like a restaurant that sells all you can eat shrimp for seven bucks or something. You get a lot of people in the restaurant and you lose money on every customer. 
I don't know that he was making money, but he was pricing it to sell, but he didn't make profit, I don't think. He told one of those original distributors he was going to keep about 150 of every set for a rainy day. And many of the sets that did happen, and those are the sets that went to Bill and Todd in the private auction, but they didn't get anywhere near that amount of 101 bags and the 83 four first series bags because you know, Levin had to succumb to some of the pressure. Hey, I, I need an extra Bulls bag. I need an extra Lakers and Celtics and Dallas and Philly. I got a customer, please sell me one. And I'm sure he buckled to that a few times. And there were a few common bags that I think he did have extras beyond what was going to be his personal stash of cards to keep for a rainy day. But the key bags, I think he did sell out down to his quantity. But as some of those common bags, I mean, I remember you could still get 85, six Pacers bags all day long. So there were a few like that. Guys, this is the same hobby that if you tra track over the last year or two, that I believe a majority of people in the hobby believe that breakers get preferred loaded boxes. And when I've confronted that, what is your evidence? They don't have any evidence and there's no evidence that would prove it to them. This is a hobby that thrives on conspiracies and expecting people to do tricky things. They think Panini is giving preferred boxes to these breakers or tops or fanatics is given to their preferred fanatics live people. So this is just more of the same. It doesn't mean it's true. It just means that's the way the hobby thinks. And it's always thought that way, that somebody's getting an edge and I don't know how they're doing it, but it's not fair and I'm a victim. So I'm not going to participate in that. I think Star fell into that rightly or wrongly, is that the conspiracy people think this is not going to end well for me. So I'm sitting it out. There's definitely that perception. And that's something I've been working for 30 years trying to break through that. You're the and, antidote with the knowledge and being a, a straight up guy. That's what is needed. And I'm trying to be that too. I'm not criticizing Levin for anything other than not running a tight ship. We're cognizant of that. Coming back to my perception, I'm hearing my viewers ask this question, trying to figure it out. I, I think at the time you're taking all these things into consideration, but at, at the same time, it's what becomes nuanced. Just to go back to what Dave said, would you have had a magazine or had you did it, would you have labeled it the rookie? And you're saying, I don't know. Even if you don't label it the rookie, there's something to be said that there's no demand there. But if it was, oh, I, it I put it in the book and, and there's no letters on it. And it was more expensive than the FLIR card. Always. The first I mean, card. What are you saying? I don't, you don't need the letters for the card to transact. And it was always a good card, but there was always this nervousness about, yeah, but what if they print a bunch more of them? And what's going on with this Levin guy? Well, he's a man of mystery. He didn't and, and right, sell any but, favors. But that's not nuance. That's not nuance. That's a hobby that feeds on that. What If I were Levin, what would I do? I'd have a bunch of Jordans in my safe or in my bunker, and I'd pull them out whenever I needed some money. That's what they thought. I gave him the benefit of the doubt, and I would have given him the benefit of the doubt, Dave, in 85, maybe. But the problem was they really weren't printing that many, okay? So it wasn't enough that we could have had a magazine because it was indicative of the basketball market not being mature. That's where I was going. Is It's a moot point, but if he'd have done 50,000 sets and, and declared it and people knew, we wouldn't be having this discussion. It would be a right, but there was no demand. No question. But to sell 50,000, you'd have to have a major distribution plan working through all the hobby shops. Not, hey, if you saw my ad, you can write it in. You can't sell 50,000 sets without pushing. He wasn't pushing. He had some major distributors that pushed, but it wasn't enough. Not even enough for 5,000 sets, guys. It didn't sell out. There wasn't demand. And that's partially there to the point. There was demand that's... if he'd have pushed it out. If, 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 there are 50 times as many of FLIR cards, and the market had grown some in those days, but still, the FLIR didn't sell out either. There was lots of remainders right. for the FLIR stuff. But did they sell tens of thousands of cases? Probably. And then they had thousands of cases left. But Star couldn't even sell thousands of sets because they didn't have a good major manufacturer distribution plan. That's what I mean by major availability and widely distributed and available in the card shops. And one table at a show might happen. One table, and it'd be Norman and Judy Kay or Joe Sack or somebody.
and they'd have them and same deal. They didn't want you to buy just the Jordans. <laughs> you have to buy a run and that ticked people off. I'm just saying you weren't there. I was at these shows. There was animosity towards Star. It wasn't they didn't like basketball. They didn't like the way Star was doing basketball. It was nonsense. Jim, these young guys, they don't remember that basketball was pretty much nothing until 88. And there was just a little sign of interest in 88. And then 89 with the David Robinson hoops, that started the explosion. The Jordan Star cards are rookie cards. I just don't think they're RCs. And I think that anybody can say what they want to say. I'm not in charge. But historically, it was listed as an XRC, and I don't think it did damage to the card. In fact, it continued to go up. Again, chart the cards, guys. You'll see that when I was in charge, there was a steady increase in the uh, Star Company card and, a, and a, a flattening or even a reduction in some of the FLIR cards because that's what the demand was. So I'm hard-pressed to see how the XRC hurt that card. Now, the biggest news in the Star universe is PSA announcing a couple of years ago they're going to grade him. Dave, you did great, and I, my hat's off to you because you had to get out there ahead of it a little bit. Bold action can provide some bold rewards many times. You talked about the mantle, the 51. Do you think maybe this is that situation? Maybe the Jordan is the true rookie card and the 86 Fleer is just iconic, larger than life, and will always be in that same paradigm there? You desire to put these things in the same box. And I'm saying they don't need to be in the same box, that, that every XRC does not have exactly the same characteristics. Every RC is not, but is there similarity? Yes, but I don't need to conform the definition. The definition is broad enough, uh, Ryan, to include both those situations. Well, let's just say that. But to narrow the definition down so that it fits one and not the other, that's not a benefit to anybody. I know you want to make it clean. But whenever we would do a definition, the card companies would figure out a way to backdoor us or to figure out a way, okay, if that's the rule, then we'll bend that rule. So we didn't articulate all the rules, but there were some guidelines that Victor Roman's trying to piece together. But is it similar? Yes. It, it's not a winner take all. There can be people on either side and both sides can do really well. But to all of a sudden say now, you know what? That FLIR is not a legitimate rookie card. Chris Sewell, Collector, investor, dealer in that order. Back in the day, it was just collectors and dealers. Now there's investors. The people giving feedback now for this issue are the eyes, <laughs> are the investors. I'm not hearing from collectors and dealers. I'm hearing from investors. I hear from them too, Ryan. And they think, hey, th this is the way it should be. And I'm saying, you can think that, but it's not the way it was for these reasons. But it's a free world, just like eBay. You can put anything down you want. And it's not a lack of integrity to say, I believe this is the true rookie card. Disagree with that stance that was taken those years ago. I, I don't have any problem with that. But just don't tell me I made a mistake at the time. Let me be crystal clear. No, it is very logical where you came to the conclusion. It's not that it's wrong. You're looking at weighing all these factors into it, taking into account at that time. So don't think I'm saying you just said, I hate Star and I'm going to do this. No, I, I, well, I don't. I hated Star and I still bent over backwards. That's what ticked <laughs> me off about Darren. I did not like Star and I bent over backwards to give them second chances, third chances, and give them their day in court, their day in the marketplace. And that was the right thing to do. So I'm just saying, I'm trying to do the right thing. And I know you guys are too. It's just that the people have a vested interest in it. And I, I really didn't other than I want what's good for the hobby. And I think if things are capricious, that's bad. But if things get overly detailed, you don't, shouldn't have to have a PhD to enjoy the hobby. You shouldn't have to get a glossary out every time somebody says, hey, this card is this. It's my lifetime hobby. It's the greatest hobby of all time. And the fact that there's controversy or difference of opinion, it's not even not a bad thing. The day nobody argues or disagrees about stuff, if we don't have a dynamic element, that's horrible. Then if it's crickets, that's bad. I want to be clear on my understanding, like you're open to that 52, 51 Bowman mantle. It's not an exact fit. I don't want to say something where you're going to come back and be like, no. I've read it as an example. You did. So this tension that sort of is not logical, why the first tops card be worth more than the true rookie card. So I brought it up, but you're tr trying to be too deterministic. It has to fit this way because this is the exact definition of something. It's a little more squishy. And I know you don't like that. I don't like it either. That's not my personality. The talking me off the ledge were my buddies saying, 
allow it to be a little bit squishy, that it doesn't have to be so deterministic that, that we can have a definition that fits 90% of the things and some things are, are close, but it, it more fits that than something else. That's all I'm saying. I really appreciate your time and your expertise and your passion. Again, the, the day we don't have this is the day we can all go home and look at our cards, not have anybody to trade them with or sell them to. You definitely made me think. What's funny, you're telling me I'm a little more rigid. I actually said in my analysis, you have to be flexible in your classifications and everything. So I think what I have actually come out is you're not as rigid <laughs> as I thought. Sounds like you're saying if it is like a, a 50, you know, one 52 tops, almost who cares? Who cares? But in the price guide aspect, they're going to sell for what they're going to sell for. And, and the card has really jumped up in the last couple of years. But I make a distinction, Ryan, between a personal definition and a corporate de de definition. And I had to make a corporate decision. And that decision was not in 85. And Dave, I, I'm glad it wasn't. But it was in 90. But then I had five or six years of seeing star company stumble. But I still gave him the benefit of the doubt. So I had to make a corporate decision. And uh, a lot of people listened. But not everybody but more than half the people, certainly at that time. But now I'm an old guy. People can make their personal decisions, but my corporate decision, I, I still stand by. How much of the decision was based on the dealer surveys? You mentioned earlier, you said you did a lot of dealer surveys at the time. Uh, we we're constantly doing the dealer surveys, constantly. It wasn't a coin flip, Dave. Yeah. Substantial support. Again, you can see we printed all these readers' rights. There, there wasn't anybody griping to say, how dare you do that? We got all kinds of feedback and it was either silent assent or agreement, but not vociferous dissent. But earlier you mentioned they that did you know, on there other might be... they did on other things. So it wasn't like we were never. But earlier you mentioned that there might be 50 or more FLIR cards for every one star card. So if the dealers being surveyed had 50 times as many FLIR Jordans, it would be in their best interest to want that to be a, the rookie card, right? Because they could sell 50 times as many Jordan rookie cards each well, year. You're missing the point. They were calling it a rookie card. I wasn't. They were. I wasn't the one calling it a rookie card in 86 or 87 or 88 or 89. They were. Because they, they, because they had 50 that. times as many of them. I said it was an RC in 1990, and that's because what everybody else was saying. And 50 times as many were saying it, yeah. But it just seems like everyone stood to benefit financially by pretending the third-year card was the rookie card because they had 50 times as many of them. I don't know if they're pretending. They perceived it as the first card from a major manufacturer that they respected and they didn't think was price gouging them. Readily available, it fit all the criteria other than the third year, which goes to my question of every card is a rookie card. It's a question. Once you have a card, you have a rookie card. Which card is it? It's the first card that's licensed in major distributed, major card company, pack pulled, a whole bunch of things. And if you can't get 10 out of 10, as Victor points out, if you get an eight out of 10, it's the best of the rookie cards and you put an RC on it. That's the flexibility I had. If you say it's not all 10, then they're in the rookie card. You can't say that. So yeah, other people said it, Dave, and I was not making something up. It was what the consensus was at that time. Again, Star was not a major manufacturer. I'm not suggesting you had any financial incentive, but it seems like everyone that you surveyed had a huge financial incentive to want the FLIR to be the rookie card because they could sell 50 times as many Jordan rookies each year. They had a financial incentive to go gobble up all the 84, 85 stars too, and they didn't do that. The 86, 87 FLIR was not a great card when it first came out. It wasn't expensive. Those boxes were remaindered for a year or two. Like Steve said, in 88, people started catching on, wait a minute, this is the first nationally distributed, really readily available Michael Jordan card. Maybe we ought to not be remaindering this junk wax, which it was essentially junk wax, 86, 87 FLIR. But by 1990, Jordan's a superstar and yeah. everyone wants them and dealers can either have one rookie card to sell or they can have 50 rookie cards to sell. No, it's not either or, Dave. They, they, they can get what they want to get, but the star company was not readily available and the FLIR was. So I don't think it was a financial thing. If somebody walked in their shop and they had star company cards, they would have bought them. But that didn't happen very often. If, if, if they got FLIR product, they, they had that to sell. They, dealers promote what they have to sell. Star was too sparse. The man